All right, all right, all right. Again, you all, we are continuing this awesome journey of discipleship. Moving from a believer to a disciple, I really feel that this is such a fundamentally important, important subject for our Bible study. And for some, this may be new. For others, so just a just a a a reminder of the importance of us striving to be more like Jesus. So we're going to do part three: extraordinary, extraordinary love for people. Moving from a believer to a disciple, and the topic is how deep is your love. And so as we kind of move into the lesson, true disciples are known by the depths of their love for people, especially for those who are different or difficult. Love is a clear indication of devotion to Jesus than church attendance. Proclamation of faith, Bible study, let me read that again. Love is more clear indication of devotion to Jesus than church attendance, proclamations of faith, Bible study, spiritual gifts, or service. Love is the most important trait of a disciple. Genuine love, deep love, consistent love, and sacrificial love. So we're going to talk about extraordinary love for people. For our memory verse this evening, it's going to be coming from John 13 and Excuse me. So jump 13, 34 through 35. It says, and this is out of the message translation. I told you I love the message translation because that's just the plain English translation. Let me give you a new commandment. Love one another in the same way I love you. You love one another. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples when they see the way you have, to see the love you have for each other. So the opening question that I would like for us to kind of discuss this evening, do you agree or disagree that the church has an image problem with people in our communities, many of whom see us as narrow, rigid, and judgmental? And why or why not? And again, we're kind of talking about extraordinary love for people as we kind of dive into the lesson about the importance of us showing love. And of course, we already know it's going to take the Holy Spirit to love difficult people or people from a different culture or people that's different from us. Um, but I promise you this question is going to tie into the lesson. So do you agree or disagree that the church has an image problem with people in our communities, many of whom see us as narrow, rigid, and judgmental? Why or why not? So come on, the floor is open to tackle this, this interesting question. So what are your thoughts? I'll go. Yes. So I think that the common or the expected answer would be yes, that you know the world sees the church as being unaccepting or this or that or the other. Right. And I think to some degree that that is true. But because of where we where we are in the South and really, even if people don't believe in God, they have the tradition of going to church and right. the tradition of, you know, they know even when the drug dealer drive by the church, he turned his music down, that kind of thing. So there is a certain amount of respect for the church, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you are able to effectively right. minister th to them. So I think and I may be just skipping ahead, but it's it's easy pickings because you can just, if you just are kind and walk in love towards people when they showing out, it shocks them. And I guess that answers the question. Yes, they do see narrow and rigid and judgmental because it's so easy to surprise them when you're just kind and loving and don't even acknowledge whatever they're doing, that kind of stuff. So right. yes. Uh -huh. and <laughs> No, very good. Very good. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Well, do you all agree or disagree uh, with the opening question? What's your thoughts? I don't doubt. Oh, go ahead, Sean. Go ahead. Go ahead, man. Well, I was just going to say that um, I agree with Sister Lisa, but I think it's more so not... Uh, 
that the church has has the image problem. I think it's just how the people, you know, as I and speaking from you know my personal experience when I was out there, you know, not wanting to live that life. I felt like the church was judgmental towards me, but when I actually decided to, wow. you know, come into the church, that wasn't how they viewed me. So I think it's more so a, a, a individual um, issue and not necessarily the church. That, 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 that's a, that's a, that's a good take on it. Very interesting take. Very good. Sister Sean, I think you were trying to um, say something as well. Yeah, I agree with Sister Lisa and Megan. Um, I don't, with this question, it can kind of go either way. Right. Okay. And with the and with the church, you know, in my opinion, you kind of have to, is it the old church or the new church? When I say old church, I'm talking about like old church of God in Christ, like when my mama and them was coming along, like. Right. Women shouldn't wear makeup. You shouldn't wear red lipstick. You shouldn't show your arms. You know, if you did things like that, then you're a Jezebel. Yeah, that was old school. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so it's like you were even judged before you could tell your story. But then if you had um, saints, you know, church members that grew under that ruling, it's right. easy for you to believe and adopt those principles because mm -hmm. I know like my mom told me when she was growing up, she was told that um, only the saints or Church of God in Christ people, they were the only ones that was gonna go to church. Everybody else, I mean, gonna go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Everybody else gonna go to hell. You see what I'm saying? So right. I think um, as we grow, you know, get closer to God and our walk, we have to be more open-minded and develop a relationship for ourselves, because I tell you, a lot of times, just because somebody do wear the short skirts and wearing lipstick and they the smoke, a lot of times they'll be more there for you than the people who don't do those things. So that's why you shouldn't be so judgmental. I mean, wow, these were some very, very interesting dialogues, a very interesting conversation. Anyone else would like to um, tackle that before we move on? I agree with all the answers, and I, I would say this, and I don't know if you all agree with me or disagree with me, and I would definitely need your perspective because I do realize that as the pastor, I could potentially be in a bubble, but when I am just living my life, I don't go by or the handle of Pastor Scott and all of that is not... Um, familiar and less people know me. I just don't start off a conversation letting people know that I'm a pastor. And because of that, I do get a chance to get to know the person and they get to know me as Ted or Lamont, depending on uh, which side you, you know me from versus the pastor. Because I've often said this, if you've had a positive experience with church, then when somebody mentions you've been a uh, or if I mentioned myself being a pastor, then I may have a favorable um, response. But if they've had a negative experience, it may not be so favorable. And I do feel that the church is, from my experience, okay, that the church is being very um, conscientious about showing love, being very aware about having an inviting atmosphere. But it kind of goes back to balance because something Megan mentioned that I, I agree with, if your mind is not made up, I don't care if we say whatever we say in very love and in kindness and just meekness, if a person is not ready to change, they may be offended by the truth. But again, we have to make sure that based off the lesson that we are showing love, and that we are showing a place that a person can have grace. So I, I think it could be either way. I think the answers could be either way, just based off your experience. A very, very, very good dialogue, you all. So I'm going to read a few opening scriptures that's going to kind of set the trajectory of, of this lesson. First John 4, 7 and 8, out of the New Living Translation says, Dear friends, 
Let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who love is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not, does not love, does not know God for God is love. Isn't it such an interesting development in this scripture? Because I can remember what Sean McDonald was saying in reference to the traditional Pentecostal church, the rigidness, the focus on the out, outward. And it's been my experience where a person would get called out on their outward attire. And again, my experience, again, I'm not saying everyone's like that. So just for sake of conversation, that I remember seeing people get called out on the outward appearance. Again, pants, makeup, all of those things that was traditionally taught that was connected to salvation somehow. Some people still teach that way. Most of us don't um, because you can have all of the outward appearance. You can have whatever the physical demeanor of what we traditionally would call sanctified, but not have what 1 John 4, 7, and 8 would say, that ultimately, out of everything that we do, we thank God for the church services, we thank God for the Bible studies, all the things that we feed into our spirits to connect with God, but 1 John 4, 7, and 8 says that he, we will be known our connection with Jesus Christ, our connected connection with God, an attribute of being a child of God is love. And so hopefully we're going to get deeper into that understanding the different types of love, that love is accountability too. Sometimes we have this misconception that if I love you, that I agree with all of your behaviors and agree with your ideology, and that's the furthest from the truth. What love simply means is that I can disagree with you, but love the God in you or to already understand that you're made in the image of God. So even with that, we have to understand that part of the DNA of us being a believer has to be that we show love. So also another supporting scripture is 1 Corinthians 13 and 13. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope and love. The greatest of these is love. As we begin to break these scriptures down, as we talk about faith and hope and all of these things, that's a, a very common theme in our services, in our Bible studies, just in our, in our Christian conversations. Sometimes if we're not careful, we do not stress the love component. You know, First Corinthians was saying that all of these are great. Faith is great to be able to name it and claim it. Hope is also a phenomenal Christian experience, our ability to be uh, uh, forward thinking, our ability to be able to hold on to faith and, and to be able to be optimistic about the future, even though we may be in an uncomfortable situation now. But out of all of those things, love is the greatest of all of these. And finally, as the open the scripture, Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, and this is out of the King James translation, New King James, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded, rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that may feel, be filled with all the fullness of God. You all I often say this all the time, is that our mortal, our human mind cannot really comprehend the vastness, the, the, the richness, the phenomenal aspects of God's love. And that's why many times it's hard for us to accept God's love because we feel that God's love, we equate God's love to the love that we've experienced here on earth. And so when we talk about, can we really comprehend the, the, the width, the depth, the height of God's love? Many times we can't, but we can ask the Holy Spirit to give us the capacity to give us the, 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 the knowledge or the open spirit to be able to receive the kind of love that God has for us. And so when we think about 
being a disciple, moving from a believer to a disciple, we cannot disconnect the love component. And that out of all the qualities, and there's so many qualities that we have that will characterize us as scriptures, I want us to understand and to comprehend and to get the fact that love is one of the greatest characteristics that tie us to our relationship with Jesus Christ. So now we're gonna kind of talk about the four dimensions of love. So when we talk about the four dimensions of love, the first one is loving the least. If I can get someone to read, and do we have any comments in the chat box before we move on? Any comments in the chat box? Okay. Is there any way I can get a volunteer, if you don't mind, to read Matthew 25, 31 through 40? When we talk about the four dimensions of love, the first one is loving the least, loving the least. Can I get someone to read that, please, if possible? Oh, yeah, Pastor. <clears throat> Thank you. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance and king, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I, I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you gave, came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Wow, that is such a powerful, thought-provoking scripture. I want you to hear about that. I want you to listen. I want you to comprehend what we just read, that loving the least of these in society and that when we understand that mission, evangelism, it's not just a department, it's just a way of life. And that's why even at our ministry, we have somebody that's over the mission and outreach, but everybody in the church <laughs> is a part of the mission and outreach. But we don't have to wait until the church calls a special project for us to be able to witness and to show love. How powerful this conversation that Jesus was having, this is on the judgment day. He was calling he was calling the people of God to the carpet that, you know, when you are able to show love to somebody that does not have the ability to be able to do anything for you, that's powerful. And so I want us to look at this scripture. When we talk about the four dimensions of love, when we're moving from being a uh, believer to disciple, we have to really be cognizant on how we love and treat the least of them. And that's why most ministries, and we're going to get there one day. If you notice, most ministries have the outreach ministry that's geared towards these things that we talked about, prison ministry, nursing home ministry, feeding the homeless, all of those things. Because when we understand that when we do what we do for the least of them, then we're doing as unto the Lord. Um, just, just quickly, we're going to kind of talk about this, which was a phenomenal experience. We did um, have our, and of course, I'm going to give the shout out at the end, but we did have um, a, our community outreach opportunity last Saturday when we went to the Salvation Army. And when we got to the Salvation Army, it was kind of like a mix up in reference to, I guess they forgot we were coming. And so they had, started feeding the people early and we just because we were already there we were like what can we do he said well i guess you can kind of clean up and if i tell you that was such the greatest honor you know we came in there we was able to clean up mop swept wipe everything down and the joy 
that we received from doing that because we understood that what, whatever we do, we do as unto the Lord. And so I want us to just be open to the fact that the next time you see somebody that's in need, you be the blessing. The next time that you know of somebody that uh, needs something. So I want us to go out of our way. Now, I'm not saying that we need to put ourselves in danger, but when we hear, it may be something as simple as, believe it or not, you know, you may see somebody that unfortunately they have to do a GoFundMe to bury somebody, or we may see on the news on Facebook that somebody's house may have burned down. We be, let's be prayerful to look for opportunities to be able to be a blessing. So loving the least of the people in society, knowing that whatever we do, we're doing as unto the Lord. So again, just a powerful, powerful point. So our discussion question is, who are some of the least in our community? What is one thing you can do in the next couple of days to reach out to them? So the, the floor is open to answer that question. Who are some of the least in our community or what we would label the least? And what is one thing you can do or we can do or some ideas that we can do, maybe not in the next couple of days, but moving forward that we can do as um, an outreach opportunity? How do you define the least? I'm a little lost on that. Well, we are probably the, with the example that we gave are pretty much, you would say, it could be somebody that may be homeless. It could be somebody that may be in prison, may be in the hospital. Um, somebody that for whatever reason, they're not able to do for themselves. So it, it can be very, very broad. Um, and but the scripture was talking about the least the scripture we just read was equating to a person. He said, when I was hungry, you know, you fed oh, okay. me okay. Okay. Well, when I was in prison, etc. Okay, I got you. Well, I, when it first came to me, I was thinking, well, we already feeding the hungry and things like that. But I think one of the least that might get often overlooked might be the seniors. And um, Tamika just mentioned that in the the That's um, good. Chat box. But I would just say maybe even the seniors in our church, even though we don't have it many, but it could be a neighbor mm -hmm. or somebody in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And you know, like let's say sometimes you don't see them um at the church often, and you know, I even gonna throw me in the the category. So um, the other day, um, a friend of mine, her husband came over and I jokingly, I just said, would you mind if your son, <clears throat> excuse me, go in my attic and get my Thanksgiving decorations down? And he did. And he did mind. So I just really appreciate that. So, you know, maybe just something small, you know, mm -hmm. like maybe somebody at the church is sick and can't go to the grocery store. So, so okay. that's what I Say something small like that. And you yeah. do have a comment in the chat box. So I can read it if you like. Yes, please, if you don't mind. Okay. Sister Tamika wrote nursing homes, maybe going to play games or little activities with the patient. Very good. Very good. Anyone else? And again, when we talk about a community, it could be the church. So that's a very good example. It could just be somebody in the neighborhood, somebody we may know. Um, you know, in, anybody else have any uh, recommendations or something that you could do? Or an idea that others may be able to do to be able to, you know, show love to what we consider the least of the the ones in our community. Well, Pastor, I know I I we do a lot of work like that in my sorority. That is so good. Our major things that we kind of work with is our adopted school. We have an mm. adopted school that is in an underserved area in Queensboro. So. Good. Sometimes it's coats, sometimes it's bikes, sometimes it's, you know, snacks for testing day or whatever. Just really looking at people who don't necessarily have and don't necessarily even have the means to ask. Right. Sometimes meeting the need without people having to ask is the show of love. You know, you see a need or you anticipate a need. Um, that is so, to me, that counts. I don't want to say it counts more, but it just shows um, the love of God more mm -hmm. if you 
see someone enough to see the need. Right. That's good. That's good. Anyone else? Very good. Yeah. And, you know, even, even with, with, with this particular discussion, you know, when, when we kind of think about opportunities to be a blessing, you know, it's one of those situations where, you know, it, it, it gives us joy to be able to reach out to be a blessing, you know, and one of the things I just want us to kind of remember and just be prayerful is be like, okay, God, you know, give me an opportunity to be a blessing to somebody, you know, open up my eyes, my eyes and help me to be aware and believe it or not. I know they say the least of these, but believe it or not, if you know, somebody's in the hospital, that's a coworker checking on them. So there's all kinds of opportunities that ways that we can kind of show love. And a lot of times, you never know where a person is financially, you know, they may, you know, of course, from the outside, look like they have it all together and it could, something could have happened in an emergency. So it's just a blessing to be aware and a blessing to be able to try to be a blessing um, to people in our community. So very, very, very good answers. Okay. Also, number two, loving the lost, loving the lost. We talked about the four dimensions of love, loving the least, and loving the lost. Now, can I get somebody to read Matthews 9, 9 through 13 out of the message translation, please? So Matthews 9, 9 through 13. Okay, great. Passing along, Jesus saw a man at his work collecting taxes. His name was Matthew. Jesus said, come along with me. Matthew stood up and followed him. Later, when Jesus was eating supper at Matthew's house with his close followers, a lot of disreputable characters, characters came and joined them. When the Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company, they had a fit and lit into Jesus, lit into Jesus followers. What kind of example is this from your teacher? Acting cozy with crooks and riffraff. Jesus overhearing, shot back, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Go figure out what this scripture means. I'm after mercy, not religion. I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. Don't you love the message translation? Jesus read them. Jesus got them told. And how, and the reason why when we look at the Pharisees, even though in the old, in, in the in the Bible, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the law. They were the ones that everyone knew was connected with God. So many times, if you look at Pharisees, we can almost equate that to people that's in church and our attitudes. And when we look at how Jesus, this is the thing that we have to take to heart: how Jesus dealt with people how Jesus dealt with people, how Jesus had the ability to still be the Lord over the world, but still was able to humble itself to show love. Love is the loudest message that a person can hear. So imagine this, most of the people already knew, quote unquote, the riffraff, the crooks, the people that were the outcasts of society. They knew, people know the religious people in the community. And so they already knew how the Pharisees saw them. They knew and experienced how the Pharisees, the religious people of that land, treated them. So imagine your experience with church people, your experience with people that were considered the religious people of society. It wasn't the best experience. And here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus making an impact, making a name, saying that he is the Messiah and he is the total opposite of what they've experienced. And so when people experience you, when they see the love and the kindness and you're being cool, now again, you have not compromised on your standards. You are who you are. You are just, you know, you, you are convinced that God is the Lord of your life. But when you're around other people that may not necessarily see the way you see the world or love the way you love or uh, the same religion or ideology, so many things that can disconnect us from people. But one of the things that we have to always remember as a foundation, keep it the main thing, the main thing, as a church, as a ministry, as an individual, that Jesus came to save those who are lost. 
I know we use the, use the scriptures come out and be separated. That means in your attitude towards the world. And so many times if we isolate ourselves from people that's lost, isolate ourselves from people that don't know God, how are we going to build a relationship to be able to reach them, to be able to show the love of Jesus Christ? Uh, you heard me say this last week, and I'm going to say it this week. And my grandmother said, there's are two people that you will never forget in your life, the person that hurt you and the person that helped you. And so one of the things I want us to see, and this was such a powerful, powerful message that Jesus Christ saw the attitudes of the religious leaders of that, of that, of that place, and he read them and checked them. It's like, okay, you know what? Why would a doc, why would somebody go to the hospital that doesn't have any medical issues? Just like a person is physically sick, he was saying that they are spiritually sick that sin is the disease of the soul. So he's having mercy and showing mercy on them. But God also, Jesus also revealed to them their attitude towards, quote unquote, the people that we consider outsiders. So again, part of the love dimension or four dimensions of love is that loving the lost. Again, you we have to confess that we have to show wisdom and that we have to have discernment and that we have to be led by God because we do understand that some people are hustlers. Thank you, Holy Ghost. This is what I wanted to say on the last slide, but it slipped my thoughts. It is not our responsibility when we're helping somebody to try to figure out how they got in that situation. I promise you, there's enough blame to go around. There's enough blame to go around. And so if a person is hungry does it really matter how they, they really got to that position? Does it really matter that they may have gambled all their money or smoked up all their money or made bad choices or bad decisions? Does it really matter the why that they're in this situation? Their stomach don't understand none of that. They just need love and they just need food and they just need us to meet the need. So again, number two, a part of the four dimensions of love is loving the lost. So the discussion question, why is it challenging at times to associate or deal with people considered outcasts in our society? And I guess we have to, before we ask that, answer that question, and again, generally speaking, what do we, who do we, who would we consider the outcast of our society? And I want to preface this, that our society is changing so to what was con probably considered um, taboo or considered um, unorthodox or whatever we want to call it, they have our society as a whole has no as a whole has normalized a lot of things that we consider wrong. So let me put that out there. So the first question is what would we consider outcast or based off the scripture would say they kind of describe the riffraffs or, or we could use sinners, et cetera. So, um, but why is that challenging at times to associate or deal with people considered outcasts in our society? This is a really, really good question. And I'm really excited to kind of hear what your answers are. So what are your thoughts? I think for one, it might be a challenge to um, associate with them because their morals and values. Okay. Or different um, for our, from ours. And um, I know like for me personally, not all the time, but I don't drink, but I don't condemn people. But I have been to different events where there's social hour or people are hanging out. It, it doesn't bother me that they're drinking and I don't, but I've been told that if you don't drink, I don't trust you. You know. <laughs> um. So, it, and then too, I, I think you know, they, they feel judged. I don't know if I said that or not, but they might even feel judged or condemned. And that's not even in my mind, you know, what you do is your business. Hmm. That's interesting. Thank you for sharing. Yes, that's good. Anyone else? Why is it hey, challenging at times? Yes. Um, I want to say if we stop looking at people as outcasts, then maybe we can, you know, be be more helpful and be more loving in a, in a sense because mm -hmm. we have to realize that, in a sense, 
we really kind of all out. look at it at some point in time in our life we were in the same position not saying anybody's sin is different from anybody else's it's straight sin period we some people have different vices that cause them to sin mm. and another person may have something else but that still doesn't shouldn't differentiate you know how they carry on their lifestyles which i understand that the church you know is looked at at a higher standard that sometimes at the same time in the world per se is more bold than the church they really right. look at us as though we the outcasts <laughs> right <laughs> you know so no, things are changing yeah i mean if we if we just are uh, if we open our hearts and open our minds and just look at people as just people and not of what they do then maybe things will be better than what they are so good that that was a really really good perspective you know first of all just the label of outcast can have a negative connotation so that's really really good one of the things my father said that taught me superintendent test Scott, of course you should, i talk about them all the time one of the things that he said that really really helped me and i hope it'll help you he said you have to love people where they are or love people where they at. I know that's bad English, but you get the point. We have to love people where they are located. And when we can love people where they're located, that will give us the ability to be able to minister or to even connect to people, you know, just, just, in, a, um, just, just in a humanistic way. Because at the end of the day, we have to make sure we understand that they're made in the image of God. When I was going through seminary um, and taking a pastoral counseling class, one of the things that they said that helped me out, they were saying that certain assumptions that you have to have when you're trying to help people is that you have to assume and understand that no matter what a person has done, that they are still made in the image of God that you have to still love them because of their humanity. You may not necessarily agree with what they've done, et cetera, et cetera, but you have to love a person where they are. And then you have to make sure that you understand and assume that no matter who we're dealing with, they're made in the image of God, okay? Anybody else would like to tackle that question? Why is it challenging at times to associate or deal? I, and you yes. have a comment in the chat. Okay. Okay, let's move this up. Sister um, Tamika um, stated, I would say people who are struggling or going through a lot is challenging because they are easily offended because coming from someone that has it all together and they don't, it becomes difficult to talk with them or to wow. convince them otherwise so they feel judged that's good so be mindful when talking to them and put yourself in their shoes that's good that's very good okay anyone else i was just gonna say that it may be challenging to deal with these outcasts and i have that in quotation marks or the 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 lesser of of society because we don't want to be guilty by so association you know it might remind us too much of who we used to be or who we are supposed to not be. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful to walk in grace and realize that it's, it's grace for all of us. And right. it, it doesn't have to do with how good or how bad you are. It has to do with God's grace. So just to be able to, you know, you're not going to be sullied or dirty by, dirty by dealing with someone who is homeless or someone who has a drug addiction problem or someone who has an alcohol problem. It doesn't rub off, you right. know? So um, just walking in grace uh, for yourself and for them. That's good. Very good. Very good. Number three, love cross-culturally. To love, again, the four dimensions of love. The third one is love cross-culturally. Can I get somebody to read Ephesians 2? 14 through 18 out of the New Living Translation, please. I will. Okay, great. For he himself is our peace, who has made 
groups won and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting us in with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create himself one new humanity out of the two, making peace in one body to both of them God through the through the cross. He put to he came to preach peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were. For through him we both have to the Father by the one spirit. And, and so the, the, they were talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. And we know that the Jews are, when they call considered the chosen ones, um, the Jews as a race was the bloodline that God decided to bring Jesus Christ through. The Jewish bloodline. And what Ephesians is saying is that regardless if you were Jew or Gentile, that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he removed all of those barriers, okay? He has moved all of those barriers. So it barriers, so in the eyes of Jesus Christ, we are all one, regardless of your race, your creed, your color, your economic standing, all of those things, all of these barriers that we have created to divide, Jesus Christ died to destroy all of those barriers to make us one in Jesus Christ, okay? Um, but love and cross culturally, can be a challenge. It can be a challenge. So, but we are, we, we, one of the things I, I was actually, when I taught a religion class at University of Phoenix, when it was at the boardwalk a few years ago, one of the things I would always try to encourage my class to be able to listen before you speak, especially when you're dealing with a person from a different background, a person from a different religion, a person just that's different from you. And if we are not open to listen, to listen, to try to understand, not necessarily to listen, to try to agree and to move out of this mindset that I am trying to be right more than I'm trying to listen to show love, then we will create barriers to the point where we cannot connect to a person that's different from us. Another thing is that we also need to realize that when we are dealing with different cultures, that when a person don't know your culture and vice versa, it's important to ask questions because you don't want to offend. And so I don't have, I don't get offended if one of my white brothers or sisters asks me a question because they may want to know. You see what I'm saying? It's, 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 especially if I feel that the heart is in the right place. So when we talk about love and cross culturally, then that is going to cause us to really be able to humble ourselves to listen so we can listen to, to understand. And another thing I would tell the class, and I'm going to try to move on, when you understand a person's story, you may not necessarily agree with their actions or decisions, but when you understand a person's story, it gives, you the, it gives you the ability to at least see why a person thinks the way they think or the reason why they've made certain choices and decisions in their life when you can understand their life story. So the discussion question is, why do you think Sunday is one of the most segregated times of the week? I know I'm kind of low-key meddling. The floor is open. You got to think about that one, right? Culture. Okay. And, and coming from, until I came to the Word and Worship Church, I went to a very integrated church, which, you know, depending on which Sunday, could be 49% Black and 51% White or vice versa. Um, but it's just culture. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll just leave it there. Never mind. Because of our culture, we birds of a feather flock together. And I mean, that's an old adage or old saying, but it's stuck around for a reason. We, we, we have like-minded people and like-minded expressions, and we just tend to be around people who express their, their Christianity or their love for God in a way that we understand. Okay. So I think Very good. Anyone else? Again, we're talking about love and cross-culturally. 
Anyone else would like to try? And I've modified the question um, from the lesson because the, the, the question, the original question was, when was the last time that you had somebody that was of a different race? Um, the last time you had dinner or lunch with somebody that was of a different race? And when do you plan to have um, you know, dinner or lunch with somebody, or do you have any plans for somebody of a different culture? That was an interesting question, but I did modify it and to this one. So why do you all think, and that was a very good answer, Sister Lisa, why do you all think that Sunday, and again, I guess not, not everywhere, but in, in a lot of churches that it's the most segregated time of the week. What's your thoughts? I agree with Sister Lisa, and this might just be saying the same thing. Um, you know, everybody's re religious practices are different. So if you're different, you're going to be doing different things. So right. to say. Right. I, I, I know traditionally in the, for the Black church in a traditional sense, um, especially during the Civil Rights Movement and further back, the church was the one of the only places that African Americans felt that they were treated with dignity. The church traditionally was not only a um, foundation of religion, but it was also a foundation of politics. It was the found. It was the place that you would go for community and to not only be filled with the spirit, but also be treated with humanity, et cetera, et cetera. So I know traditionally, but I know as things have kind of um, progressed, you do have a lot of churches that are integrated. And of course, you know, we actually are integrated, you know, uh, to some sense. Um, so very good answers, you all. Any, any answers in the chat box? Okay. So you all, this is going to be our, Final point, um, loving my enemies, the four dimensions of love, which is the fourth one is love, loving my enemies. And I don't know if this may be the most challenging out of all three of them, not quite sure. Can I get somebody to read Matthews 5, 43 through 48, please? I'll read it. Thank you. Uh, you you have heard that it, it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do, do good to those who, who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and per persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. Powerful power of scripture. I just want to say the reason why they use the tax collector, because during the Roman times, the tax collectors were despised. The tax collectors were in um, the, in the Ebonic vernacular was considered the Uncle Tom because the tax collector was a he was a Jew. He was Jewish, um, but he actually worked for the Roman Empire and he collected taxes. The challenge of the tax collector was that he will overcharge for the taxes because he would align his pocket. So in the general society, they despised like Jesus tried to use uh, a character to prove his point of somebody that everybody universally hated and despised to bring his point around about what we should do. And we understand, let's be real, it's going to take the Holy Spirit for us to be able to do that, okay? And can somebody read Romans 12, 17, 17 through 21, please, in reference to loving your enemies? All right, Pastor. Okay. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. 
if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, I think that's self-explanatory. I, I don't think I need to even, <laughs> I don't think I even need to say anything. So um, discussion question, give a description of a time or situation you had to show love or help someone who mistreated you. How were you able to overcome that challenge? Who would like to go first? I'll okay. go. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so y'all, y'all pray for me. So um, at the beginning of the year, one of my support staff called me out of my name, and um, it was a female dog, and it was in a text, and the text was meant to her husband, and um, and it just literally killed my spirit for her to have even thought so low of me because I consider myself a good, easy supervisor. And I think that's probably right there. I'm too tender hearted. But um, now, you know, as time progressed, I'm having some other issues, but um, I ain't gonna say it subconsciously, but just consciously, I still battle knowing that I was called that and she thinks that, but I just want to judge and treat fairly. So it's it's a major challenge to do right whenever you're being mistreated. Absolutely. Very good example. Anyone else, anyone else would like to share? Okay. So I do have, we'll have two minutes left and I do have a video that I would like to share. It says pastor's dressed as homeless man in front of his church. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this. So what, I, what I'm going to do, I don't know if anybody can hear it. It says, can y'all hear it? Were y'all able to hear it? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. Yes. Well-known mega church pastor James McDonald recently posed as a homeless man stationed outside several campuses of Harvest Bible Chapel before Sunday morning services to see just how his congregation would react to his presence. McDonald, who founded and leads the mega church in the Chicagoland area, posted a video of the experiment to his Facebook page Monday. He told his congregation he was blown away by the treatment he received as he crouched next to the door of the church campuses, donning a gray mangy beard as he leaned against a TJ Maxx shopping cart, overstuffed with his life's belongings. The closer a person is to us and the less common the struggle, the easier it is to love, the pastor explained in the video. How common is homelessness? How frequently is the homeless person someone dear to us personally? Never. Moments later, the undercover McDonald is seen walking into the church sanctuary, pushing his shopping cart in front of him. When he reaches the pulpit, McDonald removes the fake, raggedy beard and oversized coat, revealing his true identity. Do you know that your Father in Heaven is giving the same graces to the person that is hardest for you to love? He is giving it. He doesn't play favorites. He's giving the grace to everyone, he said. If we're going to love like our Father in Heaven loves, we don't get to play favorites. By favorites, I mean so often we love the people when there is some benefit in it for us. The crux of McDonald's message and the intention behind his brief social experiment was to show his congregation that it's hardest to love when the problem is most common and the people are least known. Many of the interactions he had with his fellow believers, though, left him. Crying inside that beard, McDonald then showed a highlight reel, revealing a number of congregants praying with him, bringing him food, handing him cash, and inviting him inside the sanctuary. I dressed up as a homeless man and sat outside our church, he said. What I witnessed blew me away. Pastor, you're muted. 
Thank you. I just kind of wanted to end on that, that social experiment, um, which is just something for us to kind of think about, and you don't have to necessarily answer it out loud, but, you know, honestly, what would you have done in that situation? Of course, because I've showed you this, I won't be able to do this as a demonstration because you've all, especially the ones that attend the Bible study would know. But with that being said, this is something to kind of look at, especially as we kind of end and round up our lesson in reference to showing love, talking about the four dimensions of love. And part of us being disciples of Jesus Christ is having an extraordinary love for people. Okay, so. Okay, so again, I just want to thank the Word and Worship Church for our community service. Um, thank God for Sister Shinora. She was actually the one that organized it. She wasn't able to come. She had a death in the family, but I want to give a special shout out to her and her team for bringing this together. Together, And again, the Word and Worship Church, thank you so much. We have so much more planned, okay? Um, also, great job for the Pink Sunday. Just want to say thank you to everyone that participated. And again, your awareness is so, so, so important. And it's important that we do not play, uh, play with our health. Um, Sister Russian was able to organize and spearhead it. So a special shout out to Erica, which is our nurse practitioner, and Sister Wendy Robinson, which is a nurse that they were able to give out information. And again, you all, it's so, 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 so important that even though we're looking out for our spiritual man, we have to be relevant to the community. So I'm very, very proud of you all at the Word of Worship Church. Also, Brother, Brother Jordan, he is organizing. So we're going to have our men's day out. Um, and that's going to be November the 12th at 3. We're going to go to the escape room. And at 5, we're going to go to Shane's to eat. Um, for Shane, we're just asking each brother to bring $25 to kind of cover their expenses. The church is going to cover the escape room. And so we definitely want our brothers to sign up. You have to RSVP. I forgot when, uh, Brother Jordan, if you're on here, when is the RSVP? November 1st. Okay, November the 1st. And so we're going to have a sign-up sheet as well as you'll be able to confirm via text as well. So we're really, really excited for that. And I heard that the women are organizing something for the women to get together in fellowship because that's a very important part of our ministry that because of COVID, uh, we weren't able to do, but we're slow but surely getting around to that. Revival, revival, revival. Um, we are in the process of gearing up. So you all in your prayer time, I want you to start praying for the revival. We want you to invite people out um, as well. We are really believing that God is going to do some miraculous things for us to be revived. We did create an event page on the Facebook, and we would want you to log in, confirm that you're going to be there, but also invite your friends as well. And lastly, but not least, we will not be having Bible study on next Wednesday, but we are having our Town Hall Love Fest with our bishop. That's Bishop Proctor. He is our presiding bishop of the historical Louisiana First Jurisdiction. That's going to be next week at 7 at Harvest Temple Church of God in Christ. So we're encouraging everyone to come out. And again, you will receive a reminder text that we don't have Bible study next week, but we will be um, with our fellow churches in this area um, going to support Bishop as he brings forth the word. So do we have any questions or any comments or anything that we need to clarify or even answer, or even in the announcement we may have missed? Okay, but you all, I just, again, I just want you all to thank you all so much for just, you know, your support of really connecting to the Bible study. And just as a reminder, the Bible study was recorded. And so this gives us an opportunity for you to share the Bible study with your friends or even to go back and look at it as well. What I would like for you to do is get on your heart and your mind what you need God to do. And we're going to do our closing prayer. Let's bow our heads. Dear Gracious Father, we thank you for this powerful series, this lesson. Mm -hmm that we have the importance of being more like Jesus Christ. Dear Father, help us to love the way you want us to love. 
Give us a heart and a mind and a spirit of compassion to be sensitive to the people that's less fortunate, God. We know that we need the Holy Spirit to be able to love, but we're striving. We may not have done everything right, but we thank you for this powerful lesson as a reminder that one of the most important attributes that we can have as believers is to have the attribute of love because God is love. I want you to touch everyone under the sound of my voice. You know about their prayer needs. You know about their situations and petitions that's in the heavens. You also know about the people that they're praying for. God, we're touching and we're agreeing and we're declaring and decreeing that you answer our prayers according to your sovereign will. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God bless everyone and you all have a blessed evening.